Welcome to this Architecture Today webinar with Content Partners Interface, Beyond COP26, an action plan for change. Introducing your chair for this event, Architecture Today editor, Isabel Allen. Hi, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, the aim of this discussion, of course, is to reflect on COP26, but more importantly, to look to the future and um, having spent uh, an exhausting and very energizing few days up at COP26, I think um, my personal observation would be that there's a huge consensus finally about the scale of the challenge and the huge role that the construction industry has to play, but rather less clarity on how to translate that into firm actions. So luckily, we have an amazing panel of speakers who are going to share what they're doing and cast some light on that. Please do ask some questions. There'll be a Q&A at the end. So if you post your questions on the box below on your screen, as many as we can. Um, so our speakers today are Sarah Edmonds, who's from Architects Climate Action Network and also Studio Search. We've got John Koo, who's the Head of Sustainability at Interface. We have Michael Paulin, who is an author and also a director of Exploration Architecture. Anna Bond, Executive Director of Developments at Grosvenor. But first of all, we're going to hear a keynote speech from Julie Hiragoyen, who's the Chief Exec of the UK Green Building Council, who have just launched their own Net Zero Whole Life Carbon Roadmap. Thank you, Julie. Okay, so I'm going to be talking to you about uh, a whole life carbon roadmap for the UK built environment, which we launched at UKGBC at COP26 on the 11th of November um, in the presence of the UK government and various other stakeholders. So UKGBC is one of 10 GBC's green building councils across Europe who are developing these whole life carbon roadmaps at a national level for the built environment sector uh, as part of a World Green Building Council Building Life project, which is funded both by Laudes Foundation and IKEA Foundation. And the goal for these roadmaps is very much to uh, identify a pathway for decarbonisation of, of the entire built environment sector. So considering emissions across all life cycle stages and uh, all asset types. So in other words, whole life carbon emissions from both buildings and infrastructure, but not including transport. Uh, the work that we've done here in the UK has given rise to four key outputs. An up-to-date comprehensive carbon footprint for the UK built environment, which includes consumption emissions, that is the emissions that relate to imported construction materials, and a carbon trajectory all the way out to 2050 which indicates the route to net zero for this particular sector, drawing on a number of assumed policies and actions by way of inputs. Um, we've also developed a, a set of uh, policy recommendations to enable and drive that trajectory, as well as a series of stakeholder action plans, which really set out the direct actions for individuals and organizations across the industry. Um, so in terms of the um, key output, in terms of the, the, the latest footprint of the UK built environment, this infographic shows the latest full um, Committee on Climate Change data set, which is 2018, which is broken down into emissions that are associated with the built environment. So at the top there, you see the whole UK emissions, both imported or consumption related and non-consumption related, Seven, 703 includes imported emissions um, and the 539 doesn't. And then we break that down into the bits that the built environment is directly and indirectly responsible for. So it's really important to say um, that the carbon footprint of the sector really varies depending on what you include in the scope. So if we focus on emissions under the direct control of built environment, so the energy usage in buildings and, and, and of infrastructure assets and the embodied carbon, then that's that represents 25% of, of UK emissions. Um, of those controlled emissions, the largest single source relates to energy usage or operational carbon, as it's sometimes called, within our existing homes. That's about 50% of our total built environment direct emissions. And it's primarily due to the fact that about 85% of our homes in the UK are heated by gas boilers. Our housing stock is very old um, and only about half of our homes have, have any form of external wall insulation. Then, then um, the next lighter blue 
um, amount relates to the energy usage or operational carbon in non-domestic buildings so all other buildings and that's about 23 percent of total built environment emissions and then the gold brown beige sort of uh, colors relate to embodied carbon so that's carbon that relates to the, the manufacture transportation the assembly of construction products and materials related to all asset types um, and those figures are really important. It's important to include the imported emissions actually there because those make up about 30% of the total embodied carbon emissions. So it's really, we think it's really important to include them. If you did include surface transport, you'd then get to that 42% figure, um, which is influenced, of course, by the way built environment, urban places and spaces are designed and planned. Um, you know, we, we use surface transport to get between buildings, between cities and places. But of course, it's not so directly controlled. Um, so that common figure, which um, people will recognize, that sort of 40% figure of our total carbon footprint does include transport. So if I move on now to um, the trajectory out to 2050, this is perhaps the most important chart in the, in the research that we've done, um, because it represents the emissions of the built environment sector based on actual data past and present all the way up to 2018 and then it projects that out to 2050 based on modeled data so those slightly grayed out uh, historical emissions from 1990 up to date up to now are grayed out on the left hand side of the graph um, it's clear that we've reduced our emissions since 2010 probably by about 25 percent but what isn't so clear from this chart is that that's largely due to grid decarbonization and in fact, in the report itself, you will find graphs that show that the actual energy demand from um, both domestic and non-domestic assets hasn't really um, reduced dramatically in that period. So we're not really addressing the root cause of, of the problem. When we look ahead um, to 2050, the dashed line indicates a business as usual projection based on the existing policies that we've got in uh, from government today. So as you can see by that endpoint, those four a long way short of net zero by 2050. More encouragingly though, that downward curve on the right hand side is the model trajectory, which um, has been informed by, by forward looking projections and based on the latest industry research. And I would want to emphasize, we didn't model any forward looking projections that had no basis in either current strategies, goals, published um, uh, policies uh, and so on. So one example, for example, um, one example was the Construction Leadership Council's National Retrofit Strategy, which envisages that almost all homes in the UK will be retrofitted by 2040 with a fabric first approach. Um, of course, then also combining that with the widespread adoption of, of heat pumps or uh, low carbon forms of heat. And although that starts quite slowly in, in the 2020s, um, as, as skills and resources accumulate, it actually speeds up then in the 2030s and it leads to that sharp drop in that darker blue segment um, within that time frame. One of the unintended consequences of that, of course, is, as you can see from the gold categories on the graph, um, that the uh, investment in the energy efficiency kit going into our existing homes, like insulation materials or heat pumps, glazing and so on, will actually lead to a bump in the embodied carbon emissions as we do that. Um, but it was, of course, it's necessary in the longer term. Um, the, the embodied carbon itself, the, the, you know, the reductions are less pronounced. Um, the decarbonization of material supply chains won't be immediate and actually construction demand will continue to grow. Um, but the trajectory indicates for that reason that by 2035, the embodied emissions will start to take over as the main source of emissions in the built environment. So it's really, really crucial that we do start to address those. And then as I uh, move on to conclude, really, what, what does all of this mean? Well, the really important point is that that business as usual line says that without urgent and immediate action now, both from policymakers and from industry, we're not going to achieve that decarbonisation pathway for the sector. It's eminently possible to achieve it and that, that's the real positive of the work, um, but clearly we need to act fast in order to get, get stand a chance to, to achieve it. And particularly, um, the most important piece is to achieve those near-term reductions by 2030, which are so essential to limiting temperature increases to 1.5 degrees. So one of the key outputs of the work has been this summary for policymakers. It spells out fairly precisely where the policy and regulation is required from government and local government to close that gap. 
And these are the five absolutely critical areas where we need new policy um, to be filling those gaps. So a national, a national retrofit strategy or plan for our homes, our existing homes, um, more focus on uh, real-time energy use um, disclosure for all our other buildings, designing for the ultimate energy usage within the buildings, not, not, not basing our design um, targets on, on modelled performance, and then really driving down that embodied carbon and doing whole life carbon assessments, as well as making national infrastructure um, investment uh, decisions based on the overall impact of, of infrastructure assets. Um, and the last thing I would flag is, you know, there are these 14 action plans, fairly detailed action plans for various different um, businesses and, and subsectors within with the industry. Um, clearly, I would particularly encourage readers of architecture today to, to access the architect's action plan that focuses on skills, whole life carbon assessments, performance metrics and targets and, and post occupancy evaluation amongst many other things. So a quick canter through what's been almost a year's worth of hard work by by many organisations and please do look on the website for the outputs themselves. Thank you. So I should say that we're going to be joined later on by Sunand Prasad, who um, is, as you all know, a former president of the RIBA and a founding director of Penaran Prasad Architects. But more pertinently to today's discussion, he's also chair of the UK Green Building Council. So if you do have any questions about Julie's presentation or the work of the UK GBC generally, you will have a chance to put those to soon and later on. Uh, but now I'm going to introduce our next speaker who's going to give us a client's perspective. It's Anna Bond, who's the Executive Director of Developments at Grosvenor. Thank you. If you don't know Grosvenor, we're a global real estate business with 11 billion pounds of assets under management. And we're also family owned, which allows us to take a genuinely long-term approach to our investments. In the UK, we're probably best known for our historic portfolio in Mayfair and Belgravia, but we also have a really significant regional portfolio with a pipeline of 20,000 homes, a stake in Liverpool One Shopping Centre and other commercial investments. As the long-term steward of places, our focus is on how we can redefine climate action in our sector and support successful communities. We've been working toward becoming a more sustainable business for over 15 years, really accelerating our ambition over time. 2019 was a watershed moment for us. That year, we published some of the most stretching sustainability goals in the sector, committing to net zero carbon, zero waste and enhancing biodiversity. And a year ago, we launched our pathway to net zero. Since then, this pathway has been verified by Science-Based Targets Initiative, which is the gold standard for carbon commitments. And we also announced earlier this year that we would become carbon neutral across all scopes by 2025. But from now, we will only design new developments that will be net zero on completion. So here you can see our four green goals. In working towards net zero, our development team is particularly focused on cutting carbon and working effectively with our supply chain, bringing our partners with us. But before I speak about development, I wanted to mention that to get to net zero, we knew from the very start, we needed to transform every element of our business. And this has seen us invest in the internal skills and new roles, really make success a core part of people's individual responsibility through goal setting as well as bonus structure. Uh, and also we've established a team which champions and enables innovation. As well as setting those things, we've also put uh, tools in place for our success. And many of these are open sourced on our website and the link is at the bottom of this slide. Um, it's free to access. Uh, and I'll talk about some of them uh, in a moment. So between 2019 and 2030, development activity is going to account for 23% of our business as usual emissions. Not only is our approach to development vital in meeting our embodied carbon commitments, but our job is to design developments which are operationally net zero as well. And again, tools are absolutely critical here. So for development, we've developed a number of bespoke frameworks, 
to help us measure performance and really help us make really good decisions. So the first is the roadmaps. So our, we've got a long-term goal and that's split down into annual targets, ensuring that we, we are actually taking the individual steps needed to get us where we want to go. We have created a sustainable development brief, which articulates how we deliver our 2030 goals and community aspirations across development projects. And that also governs about how we work with supply chain as well as JV partners. Now this sustainable development brief is then backed up by an environmental scorecard, which kind of meticulously tracks the individual components of environmental performance. And they're a key decision-making tool during the design process. And projects that don't score highly enough, frankly, just don't get approved. Another element is that suppliers are absolutely critical to our success. And for me, they've got real two big roles. The first is challenging and really helping us innovate to meet our goals. But the other is about committing to address their own footprint because their scope three emissions are included in our net zero calculation. Um, we've got a supply chain charter that clearly sets out our own commitments alongside the standards that we expect of those that we work with. And we've actually recently tightened these so that from 2023, we intend to only award contracts of over a million pounds. This is across the whole business, not just in development, to suppliers with a science-based target. So Multiplex, um, who we've recently appointed at 65 Davies Street, our office development in Mayfair, is the very first example of this. So not only do they have a science-based target, they've also got a really impressive track record in innovating to drive down carbon on sites. Our charter also lays out the help that we're going to provide our supply chain. The kind of the training that we've initiated for lots of people has been really well received. And in 2023, we're running a mentoring programme to help SME suppliers set science-based targets. But we know we can't achieve a, a zero carbon built environment alone. And I'm sure I'm not going to be the only person today uh, talking about collaboration. Partnering with many of the organisations that you see here has been absolutely crucial for us to help define and deliver our pathway so far. We're contributing to joint industry initiatives like Steel Zero, and we're also part of the UK GBC's um, Circular Economy Forum and have published our own research and guidelines on material reuse with partners like Arup and Elliot Wood. Finally, I wanted to show how the targets and tools and working with innovative and collaborative suppliers comes together in practice. On completion next year, Holbein Gardens will be our first net zero development. To succeed in our goal, we had to entirely change the way that we thought about a client brief, the ways of working and design. So for example, we first looked at the site to see what was available rather than design a building and see then what was available. So we took a holistic approach to embodied and operational carbon, including a whole life carbon assessment. We've looked at materials innovation, including cross-laminated timber in the rooftop extension, semi-free concrete, as well as reclaimed brick and repurposed steel from this and other Grosvenor sites. And whilst we've focused on carbon, each development also contributes to all four of our goals. And we've really pushed ourselves, for example, on the biodiversity side, as well as on, the, as well as on waste. When leasing this all electric scheme, it's going to be on a green lease and tenants will need to maintain the biodiversity features as well as continuing to commit to reduce waste. So hopefully that's given you a flavour of how we're driving uh, zero carbon development at Grosvenor. Um, and if you'd like to find out more, go to grosvenor.com forward slash going for zero, where lots of the things I've talking about, talked about are available open source. Thank you. Anna, I just wanted to pick up on what you said about these open source uh, digital tools. Are you able to tell us a little bit more about how they, well, what they do and how they actually work? Yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, for us, kind of, as I said, bringing 
kind of being a champion for climate uh, in our industry is really important, which was why we decided that making the things that we are creating available for everybody to help, because we spent a lot of time doing these things, actually it was the right thing to do. So on our website, we've got, you know, in, I mean, really great detail, our strategies um, to reduce carbon and offsetting. We've put on our supply chain charter, which is our kind of our commitments so that you know, anybody could have a look at them and adopt them themselves. The sustainable development brief that I talked about, um, actually, we've had a number of other developers coming and approaching us, asking us if they can use it, which is absolutely fine. Um, and you know, also on the website, we've got things like the tenant fit out guides. And some of that explains the Grosvenor process of how do you get approval for your tenant fit out. But it also includes kind of our environmental requirements as part of that so that tenants, you know, can give it to their design team at the beginning and design something that's going to get approval rather than submit something and then they have to go back to the drawing board. Um, we've also got, we've also actually in quite a big section um, of the material reuse work that I that I mentioned and in there we've got the you know data as well as guides from a number of other um, companies. So Orms, for example. Um, they've got a they've got a guide as part of that. I think theirs is a passport one around material passporting. So um, the easiest way of finding it, because funnily enough, I actually had a look this morning to see what was the easiest way of finding it. It's actually the easiest way of finding it is if into Google you type Grosvenor Environmental Leadership and it takes you to the page that has all of this open source data. Um, so that's the easiest way of finding it. So yeah, if you Google Grosvenor Environmental Leadership, you'll be able to access it all and it's all set out really clearly. Great, thank you very much for that. Um, I'm gonna move on now to our next speaker, who's Michael Paulin. Um, Michael is, of course, the Director of Exploration Architecture, but he's also just published a book which he's co-written with the urbanist Sarah Ichioka. Um, it's called Flourish, and I will let Michael talk about it. Hello, so I'm Michael Paulin. Thanks very much for involving me. And what I'm going to be talking about today is a, a new book I've got coming out, which is co-authored with Sarah Ichioka. So uh, equal credit to uh, Sarah for, for what I'm talking about. And in many ways, this, this all started in October 2018. It was a, a, a turning point for me. I'd been working on transformative projects for quite some time. And um, some of those got built, a lot of them didn't. And uh, the most regular bit of feedback I was given for why they weren't proceeding was I was, I was told that the market's not ready for these yet. And, and these were projects like zero waste, zero carbon textiles factories, ultra low energy data centers, uh, the biomimetic office, which was going to be one of the lowest energy office buildings in the world. So it was quite frustrating to be told that. And when the IPCC report came out in October 2018, showing that we were essentially within uh, you know, 10 years of, of civilizational collapse, I thought, well, this is just completely absurd. You know, how can we be this close to, to collapse? And yet I'm being told that the market is not ready for these ideas yet. So I reread one of my favorite essays. Uh, it's called Leverage Points. It's by Tanella Meadows. She was a systems thinker. And in this essay, she talks about the best way to bring about change. And she, she lists 12 different places to intervene in a system and argues that the best way to bring about change is to intervene at the level of the paradigm or mindset that drives the system. And uh, it was around this time that I also met up with Sarah for one of our regular ideas sharing sessions and found that we were both in a very similar place in terms of our concerns about the state of the environment and also concerns that there were some some crucial elements missing from the sustainability debate. So Sarah is also a fan of Danella Meadows and we set out to write a book about a shift in paradigms and principally a shift from sustainable to regenerative. Since then, there's been a huge growth in the use of the term regenerative, but there's still a lack of clarity about what it actually means. In our book, we've set out to clarify that. And we're arguing that it's going to involve a lot more than sustainability with all the knobs turned up. So we describe five fundamental changes of mindset, each of which has a dedicated chapter. And I'll say a little 
bit about each of those, but very briefly. But first of all, let me explain what we perceive to be some of the shortcomings of, of conventional sustainability. So one of those is that it tends to be a rather mechanistic way of looking at things. And actually, we need a, a more sort of complex systems view. It has been um, rather uh, human focused at the exclusion of the, the broader uh, web of life on, on which we depend. Uh, and, and there's also an implication in the framing of sustainability that the best we can aspire to is to mitigate negatives. And somehow we need to get above that sort of line of, of neutrality of, of being what Bill McDonough says is 100% less bad. You know, that's the, currently the ultimate in sustainability. We need to get above that into the realms of regenerative design. And just as there have been lively debates about what the ultimate in sustainability is, we now need a vigorous debate about what the ultimate in regenerative design should be. And we believe it, the ultimate is to get to a point where we are participating and co-evolving as nature. And that's quite a complex idea, and that's why we expand on it in a full um, chapter. And there's a common theme throughout this book, which involves distinguishing certain ways in which we see the world and consciously deciding to change that perspective. So as an example, if you take the expression, time is money, it's been repeated so often that some people would assert that that is simple reality and it's not, it's a story. And sometimes the easiest way to distinguish and replace an old story is with a new one. The most persuasive one here, I believe comes from someone called Karma Shatim, head of the Bhutan Gross National Happiness Commission. And he asserted a different story. Time is not money. He said, time is life. And consider that for a moment, the likely difference between two countries or companies that are guided by those stories. If time is money, it would seem rational for someone in a position of power to commodify and control people as resources in order to accumulate profit. If on the other hand, time is life, people would be more likely to view exploitative working practices as unjust, and those in power may feel more inclined to respect people's need for self-fulfillment. Now, the thing with worldviews is that they can become so dominant that we don't even realize we hold them, a bit like a fish in water, not being conscious of the water itself. The first chapter we uh, title as uh, Possibilism. So this is about how we transform our ideas of agency our capacity to bring about meaningful change. And that term, possibilism, it comes from the, the late Hans Rosling. And his, his point was that it's not enough to be optimistic or pessimistic, because both of those positions imply some sense of inevitability about the future. What we should be, he said, is very serious possibilists. We should decide on the future we want and then set about creating that future. And we put this as the first chapter because we think this is fundamental to everything that, that follows. There has been a tendency, not just in the construction industry, but perhaps in society more broadly, a tendency to shun agency. You know, we, we have a tendency to shun responsibility. Um, and you know, often you'll hear architects saying, well, you know, there's not much we can do without a really progressive client. And sometimes even big clients say, well, there's not much we can do you know, without a, uh, you know, our, our shareholders on board and so on. And um, the problem with that is that it leads to a very slow pace of change. And if we're to meaningfully step up to the planetary emergency, we need to transform that, that sense of agency and become possibilists. And in this chapter, we outline what we believe some of the characteristic characteristics of, of a possibilist are. And that includes evidence-based action and managing uncertainty. There are a few others as well, but I'll just focus on those very briefly. So we describe some inspiring examples of evidence-based action in other fields, such as the economist Esther Duflo, who founded MIT's Poverty Action Lab and really transformed the field of overseas development going on to win the Nobel Prize in, in economic science. Uh, and that was entirely based on using an evidence-based approach uh, to determining um, how she approached that subject. And there are some good examples of evidence-based design in the built environment. We describe the, the late Sir David Mackay's work. Uh, he wrote uh, Sustainable Energy Without the Hot Air. And then people like Jan Gale, who did a lot of evidence-based work on urban planning. 
But there's also a lot of design that runs counter to this, essentially based on opinions or frankly, fantasy. I've heard a lot of examples claiming to be hugely optimistic about future technology. Well, in a planetary emergency, it's not, it's not enough to just be optimistic. We need plans for the future with numbers that add up. So moving on to the next chapter, which is titled Coevolution as Nature. The problem at the moment, and this is a problem that we have to address if, if we're going to uh, tackle the, the planetary emergency, is, is simply not going to be enough to, to just go for net zero carbon. There, we argue that there are much deeper uh, issues that need to be addressed. And one of those is that currently we treat nature as something separate from ourselves. So it's what's called a dualistic view. And I'm not necessarily saying that all of you hold that view. Some of you may not. But the dominant story of our industrialized economies is that nature is something separate that can be plundered for resources. And that view has a huge influence on the way we behave as societies. And one of our main sources here is a book called The Patterning Instinct by Jeremy Lent. And he describes how it was really this dominant view of nature as something to be conquered that uh, explained the difference between Christopher Columbus and a Chinese mariner called Admiral Zheng. So they were approximate contemporaries. Columbus set sail with three scruffy ships, ships and, and about 90 sailors and unleashed the worst wave of exploitation humanity has ever seen, arguably. Whereas Admiral Zheng uh, set sail with something like 27,000 mariners, far superior military technology. So he could have suppressed lots of societies if he'd wanted to, but he held a view of humans as embedded with a, within a web of systems. And, and that's why he did not seek to plunder any of those societies. And Jeremy Lent argues very persuasively in his book that we need to shift from this conquest of nature metaphor to seeing ourselves as embedded within a web of systems. And this has huge implications for how we design uh, the built environment. And, and that's what we talk about. So the next chapters, I can only touch on these very briefly. There's a chapter about time that's called A Longer Now, which makes the case for developing a deeper sense of time and what it means to be a good ancestor. So The Good Ancestor is a book by the philosopher Roman Krasnarek, making the case for long-term thinking and really encouraging us to think about what is our deep purpose. The uh, fourth chapter is about symbiogenesis, uh, looking at how our uh, views of what it means to be human have changed with developments in science and what that means for the built environment. Then we go on to a chapter about planetary health, where we explore the whole concept of endless growth and degrowth and make the case for donut economics as the best new model. And then in the conclusion, we really try to draw together all these strands and acknowledge that these shifts may look daunting, amounting to a transformation of human consciousness, but actually the prize that is on offer is so great that this is a challenge that we have to confront, we have to tackle. And this is really what it means to be contemporary and truly alive and relevant as a designer now. Thank you. So it's very clear, Michael, that this is the result of a huge amount of, of thinking by both you and Sarah. Um, and it's fantastic that you're able to take such a kind of overarching view. I'm very curious to know whether COP26 and the various conversations surrounding it have had any impact on your thinking or made you reconsider your priorities at all? If anything, they, they kind of reaffirmed the conclusions that we came to um, after the publication of the 2018 IPCC reports, which, which was really that 30 years of uh, conventional sustainable design had not got us anywhere really near to, to where we need to get to. And, and that's why we felt that there, there is an urgent need for a, a, a fuller discussion about how change happens and particularly how to make this shift from sustainable to regenerative. And you know, as I mentioned in, in my talk just there, um, Danella Meadows, as, as a systems thinker, I think really is very important and relevant here. And it's important to understand the difference between a, 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 you know, a paradigm and system behavior. And I think uh, quite often architects and engineers have focused on trying to tweak system behavior when really what we need to do to bring about meaningful change is, is to intervene at, at the level of the, the mindset or paradigm that, that is driving that system behavior. 
I'm sure these are things we'll come back to at the end. I think it's it's absolutely fundamental, isn't it? How much we work with the systems we've got and how much we bring about wholesale change. Um, I'm now going to move on though to our next speaker, who is John Koo, who is Head of Sustainability at Interface. Let me offer a manufacturer's perspective. Following up on the Glasgow Climate Pact and the COP26 discussion, if a product doesn't make a positive impact in people's lives, in their spaces and the environment, why would you make it? At Interface, our medium for change is flooring. And our mission is called Climate Take Back, to run our business in a way that reverses global warming. Our ultimate aim, to find a way to be a carbon negative enterprise by 2040. With the built environment and construction contributing up to 40% of global carbon emissions, there's a significant need for manufacturers to play their role to help keep 1.5 alive. So my suggestion is this, you need to be more demanding of manufacturers and their products. At Interface, our journey to lower our carbon footprint is outlined here. And it's very important that we do this soon because the time for the blah, blah, blah is over and pledges must make way for credible, credible action. And manufacturers must now find ways to reduce the carbon footprints of all their products. And this has been our journey, looking back on the carbon footprint we had for our carpet tiles in the 1990s, compared to where we are now, having reduced across the board the carbon footprint of our carpet tiles by over three quarters, and even looking at what we can do to look at carbon negative materials and products. A key part of this is looking at carbon neutral products. Since 2018, every product made by Interface, whether carpet tile, LVT, or Nora rubber flooring, has been carbon neutral for its full life cycle. We've done this by reducing and removing excess carbon emissions, working with our supply chain, and then for the remainder, using verified carbon offsets. Our view is that carbon neutral should become a standard rather than an ambition. And that if you can make a product carbon neutral now, why wouldn't you? And we've been working to further reduce the carbon footprint of our materials by embracing renewable energy, using less materials, using different materials, using recycled and bio-based materials to turn off the tap to virgin oil. There's lots of ways you can do it. But that's not necessarily enough. Considering what we do control in our supply chain and our manufacturing and how we design our products, we looked for further reductions. And ultimately, this has led us to redesigning our core product, re-engineering it. Most carpet tile in Europe is on a bitumen backing, but the problem with bitumen is twofold. It's very carbon intensive, it's fossil fuel based, and it's quite difficult to recycle back into carpet tiles. So we replaced it with a better option. And by doing so and using our new Sequest bio backing, which is now available on all our products that come from our European operations, the outcome was that we reduced the carbon footprint of our products by a third. We increased the recycled and bio-based content to nearly 90%. And we designed products more for reuse and recycling. And we went even further. Using similar technology, we've been able to create carpet tiles that are carbon negative, cradle to gate. And our Embodied Beauty collection contains our first carbon negative tiles. Sometimes it's a question of just demonstrating what might be possible. We believe that a manufacturer should be aspiring to be carbon neutral as well as creating carbon neutral products. You need both sides. And that's why recently we had our science-based target ratified that will see us cut our scope one and two emissions by 50% by 2030. And then more boldly look to cut our scope three emissions which sit in our supply chain, often in purchased goods and services, services by 50% by 2032. Now our story interface started back in the 90s with a question from our customers. What are you doing about the environment? Now we see a question more about what's your product doing around climate change. And this was our founder, the late Ray Anderson. And I'm gonna end you, leave you with this quote. We have a choice to make during our brief visit to this beautiful blue and green planet. Are we going to hurt it or are we going to help it? Thank you.
John, it's fascinating to hear how you cut out the use of virgin oil in your manufacturing processes. Um, what else has Interface done to make the carbon neutral journey? And crucially, how difficult has it been to get buy-in from your suppliers? For us, a key thing has been measurement and seeing where the impact of the manufacturer lies. And for many manufacturers, there is a lot in your factories. There's a lot in your showrooms. And so what we've been doing there is working on using more renewable energy. So across all of our factories now, we're a hundred percent renewable electricity and across the globe, when we include all forms of energy, we're at 75% renewable energy. So that's a, a low hanging fruit for any manufacturer. But another key point has been thinking about how we design our products, making sure they're designed for longevity, give a product a proper life. In part of that, making sure it's ready for reuse at the end of its life and also recycling back into future products. On engaging our suppliers, it's been interesting. I would say the lead up to COP26, everything that's happened since the Paris Agreement has led to more easy discussions with suppliers. Any supplier that's being diligent about its future or trying to future-proof its business is going to be interested in having a, a dialogue. And I think now, particularly after COP26 and the Glasgow Climate Pact, is a great time to be asking those questions. And we found that it's very easy to have those discussions now, that our supply chain become becoming increasingly savvy and they want to have these discussions. There was one warning part on that, which is if you're a smaller supplier, it can seem daunting. Like, do I need a science-based target? How am I going to afford this label or that label? And I think that's where it's important to have that dialogue and find a, a common ground on how together as a supplier, as a purchaser, you can work together to, to on, because you're all on the same journey, trying to find a, a low carbon future. Uh, collaboration, obviously a very key theme for all our speakers. Um, I'm now going to move on to our final presentation and it's Sarah Edmonds, who's a founding director of Surge, um, but also crucially a coordinator for ACAN, which is of course the Architects Climate Action Network. Thank you. Um, I wanted to share ACAN's activities at COP and our priorities now that COP has passed. But first, who is ACAN? Well, ACAN is a voluntary network of individuals from within architecture and related built environment professions taking direct action um, to address the twin crises of climate and ecological breakdown. We exist to address the way our built environment is made, um, operated and renewed um, with, in response to the climate emergency. We are independent individuals, but we come together around three aims. They are decarbonised now, ecological regeneration and cultural transformation. We have nine thematic groups from circular economy to natural materials. Um, and you can find out more at our, on our website. But let's talk about COP. So following an unsuccessful bid to participate in the green zone, but never ones to shy away from a challenge, we went to COP anyway. We felt that the construction industry is still a bit of a blind spot for our leaders, given that the built environment had one single day of focus. And we felt it was important to have a physical presence in Glasgow. And it looked a little something like this. We set up our base in many studios in the Barris Market area of Glasgow and ran and hosted a series of collaborative events. We covered topics from retrofit to embodied carbon to zero carbon homes and more. We also contributed to events beyond our own making, from workshops with Climate Fresk and Refabricate, talks at the Landing Hub, and our own Kerry Watton of ACAN Northern Ireland also spoke on BBC Radio Scotland about the built environment's place in the climate crisis. We were also delighted to have been offered space at the Glasgow New Society Galleries, which allowed us to run both a pre and post COP series of exhibitions covering our hopes for COP and those for the future. The exhibition for ACAN's Hopes for COP at the East Gallery was a showcase both of the output of ACAN, but also how we hoped to see some of these issues addressed by global leaders at COP. Here you can see a non-exhaustive selection, including the education group's actions, where they created a hugely successful climate curriculum campaign, including an education toolkit. Embody Carbon, who put huge efforts into campaigning for regulating embodied carbon, as well as the Save Safe Structural Timber campaign. And ACAN Northern Ireland detailing the actions that they have carried out, including engaging at high levels of government. But our experience at COP was more than that. It was a deeply connecting experience for those of us who were able to attend. 
It involved a rotating body of ACAN folk from all over the country participating in events and protest. And seeing each other in real life and connecting with those souls who had gotten each other through the often exhausting and overwhelming work that is climate action through lockdown and numerous meetings and campaigns over the last two years. But there was also room for humour and we ran a satirical comedy night with Glasgow's own Raymond Mearns. So what are our plans post COP? Well, you could say that this is the only appropriate place for the phrase business as usual, but more so. So hold on to your hats because there is a lot of information coming your way. The following series of posters reflect a snapshot of where our thematic groups and chapters of ACAN are currently in their plans and visions for next steps. ACAN Scotland will continue to engage with government and campaign for retrofit. Natural Materials are partway through a series of, a mass of masterclasses focusing on the fantastic natural materials available to us architects right now. Existing buildings will be continuing to campaign and educate around retrofit by developing the Households Declare campaign website as a resource and joining the dots of all the groups calling for the same thing, a national retrofit strategy. And we are working on some film content too. After an incredibly successful series of events on circular economy last year, the CE group are working on an industry guidance publication on how to apply circular economy principles across the REBA stages. Climate literacy is developing a glossary of terms and definitions to empower people to communicate the built environment's role in the climate crisis. And where the wild things aren't are working on creating guidance for local authorities to enable better decisions considering natural capital. We continue to enable replication of ACAN chapters in Europe and globally. There's a sense of doubling down on our actions, but also on continuing to push the boundaries of our reach and our agency. We will continue to work on affecting mindsets and cultural transformation through campaigning, such as our Households Declare campaign. We will continue to collaborate across the industry wherever we can to deliver data and information to the industry through collaborating on guides and reports such as we did with the Letty Retrofit Guide, and to hold policymakers to account by filling blinding knowledge gaps and regulatory gaps such as the Regulating Embodied Carbon campaign. In the last year, we have formalized our structure and become a community benefit society. We believe that this will further our agency to agitate the industry. We will soon be holding an open meeting and share more on this and our future plans. There were many takeaways from COP, and there a lot has been made of the disappointment from the Glasgow Agreement and the lack of urgency from those entrusted to lead. But one shared outcome from across our network was that this experience simply galvanised our need to take action and to continue to hold our leaders and policymakers to account, to continue to collaborate far and wide. As exhausting as it was to run our events and participate in others, it was an invigorating experience realizing that activists and communities are on the same page and that more and more those in power show how they are out of touch. If you watch nothing else about COP, watch Elizabeth Wathuti's speech. And then listen to Alok Sharma declare himself to be no drama Sharma. The thing is, we need our leaders to act, to act with some drama, some humanity, to act like this is an emergency. The problem with talking about targets and setting goals is that they often become subsumed into daily language and start to mean less than they should. Targets set by the Paris Agreement are starting to look like a positive goal rather than realising it is at the point at which, if breached, critical tipping points will push us into irreversible climate catastrophe. Nearly half of the UK's total emissions come from the built environment. The UK will not meet it's legally by binding climate change targets without near complete elimination of greenhouse gas emissions from UK buildings. The decisions we make as architects have far reaching consequences. The planet is warming faster than ecosystems are able to adapt. This is not just about tweaking the field of architecture. It's about completely reimagining it. It's about moving from degenerative to regenerative practice. It's about recognizing the impact of the decisions we make every day in practice. It's about realizing that the systems that we currently operate within are extractive, degenerative, and ultimately pushing humanity to a cliff edge. We are calling on you to use your agency. If you don't know what your agency is yet, then get to know it. Join a group or dial into a meeting. It doesn't have to be ACAN. 
Start by reading Donella Meadows or Kate Rayworth. Speak to your colleagues and family or just listen to those on the front line of climate change. It's not a complex problem to understand. We are in trouble and we all have a responsibility to act. Realize that it's a privilege to be able to opt in or opt out of taking action where others have no such choice. And in our industry, now the evidence is there. You have no excuse not to act. So what are you going to do? Sarah, it's uh, always inspirational to hear from ACAN and uh, particularly useful to have those really tangible pointers for people who want to get involved but might not know where to start. So thank you for that. Um, just for a minute, I want to take you back to COP26. Now that the dust has settled, um, what's your verdict on our global leaders' performance and what do you think the UK government should be doing next? Oh, how to say this <laughs> without uh, insulting people. Um, I, I think that the behaviour was actually incredibly disappointing of our leaders. Um, and, and stepping back a little bit as well, if you think about that, the largest delegation at COP were folk with um, ties to the fossil fuel industry. Uh, that just seems like, like I do wonder how, how did that happen? That shouldn't really have been the case. Language about the ab abolition of, of coal was watered down instead of, you know, what it should have been, which was talking about, you know, removing that entirely, you know, 1.5 degrees is barely in reach. Um, we actually needed some drama. We needed some humanity. We needed this um, opportunity for our leaders to grasp and to show that they were going to really engage with what it means to bring about change, real change, and show some compassion. I mean, I think that was hugely lacking. So um, I am really sort of disappointed as a lot of other people are with the behavior of leaders, but I'm also um, really enthused by grassroots organizations, youth movement, um, you know, and, and that's where the change is really coming from. And I think that that split between those who are leading and those who are shouting for change is just becoming so, so apparent and everybody can see that now, but it really is time for action. And it really is time to stop just the kind of vacuous discussions from our leaders. Okay, so a pretty uh, damning, but I think not unfair verdict on the performance of our political leaders. But um, as Sarah says, it just underlines the importance of the industry and the profession taking initiative ourselves. So um, I'm going to, in a minute, invite all of our panellists to join me and answer your questions. And please do keep sending them. Um, but first of all, I'm going to invite Sunan Prasad to join me. Um, Sunan, as I said earlier, is the chair of the UK Green Building Council. And um, Sunan, just harking back to what Sarah said, from your huge wealth of experience of working in practice at the RIBA, at the UK GBC, how, how do we ensure that we actually have a joined up approach across the industry, that we're not all running in different directions, but we're using our collective energy to really make progress? Thank you, Isabel. Thank you for all the presenters for very inspiring and fantastic presentations. Um, I'm not sure that lack of joining up right now is the most critical issue. I think that we've always complained about lack of joining up. This is a fragmented industry. This is an industry with huge structural issues which go back to the 19th century. And uh, I think we should keep on trying. We should keep on trying to join up and be collaborative. Somebody talked about radical collaboration. And I think that's, that's great. Um, I don't think that there is a, a, a silver bullet there. Uh, so as you say, I've been uh, in, on this for a very long time. In fact, my career almost exactly spans the realization of the limits of growth, Club of Rome 71 to COP 26, 21. And, uh, you know, en route, there have been many false dawns. Uh, 2006 looked like we'd broken through. All the political parties were saying the same thing. And then there was a massive blowback with, you know, petrol, petrochemical funded denialism and, you know, the dirty tricks. And of course, there are vested interests, uh, which are, you know, who, who are uh, not wanting this action to take place. And we have to confront them and take them on. And I think their activism is absolutely you know activism is more important than than let's say you know the uh, attempt to join the industry or anything like that i think 
the, the situation is urgent and so we have to act urgently. We, we have many questions here and a lot of them I think you'll be uh, very well positioned to answer but I'm going to invite the whole panel to join me now so if I can have back please Anna Bond from Grosvenor, Michael Paulin from Exploration Architecture and the author of Flourish, John Koo, Head of Sustainability at Interface, Sarah Edmonds from Studio Search and ACAN, and of course we still have Sunan Prasad from the UK GBC. Um, it's a certain amount, it has to be said, a certain amount of cynicism from the questions, not aimed at our panellists, but um, really going back to your point, Sunan, there's a lot of variance on the theme of we've heard it all before, what's so different now? So to pick one kind of at random, uh, I've got a question here which says, we heard all this blah, 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 29 years ago from Ed Goldsmith and Schumacher et al. Why should we believe the bourgeois net zero platitudes now? Um, and I think, Michael, I'm going to put that to you. Um, why? Why do we believe it now? Why should we have any hope that anything's actually going to change? I think th there are good reasons to be sceptical, and, and I don't think we should just believe it. I think, um, you know, Sarah talked about the importance of um, maximising our agency, and I also mentioned that. So I, I think uh, really what we need is to, to bring about a, a tipping point uh, in attitudes towards uh, the environment. And in order to do that, uh, we need to have quite a few things in place. We need to show that we've got the, the new solutions and, and mindsets articulated. I think we've got to show that the industry has the capacity to deliver them. And we need overwhelming public support. Because you know, if, if we continue with our economic model based on endless growth and consumerism, then just aiming for net zero is not going to be enough. We, we need a much deeper transformation than that. And um, the, the philosopher I mentioned, Roman Krasnarek, he, he includes in his book, I think, a really crucial graph that shows three possible pathways for civilization. One of those is called breakdown, and you can imagine what that looks like. One of them is called transformation, which is where we get on a, tr a transformative path to a positive future. But the third one is called reform. And, and that's the one that's really quite scary because that, it, that really just delays the point of, of breakdown. And the reform pathway is, is the one where businesses and mo most importantly, governments do just enough to persuade enough of the voters that they are taking meaningful action, when in reality, that action is nowhere near enough to prevent e eventual breakdown. And worryingly, that is the pathway that nearly all governments and a lot of the business world are still on. And that's not going to be enough. So uh, to summarize, you know, we, we're right to be skeptical and we have all got to look to maximize our agency. And if we come up against obstacles, we need to work together to overcome those. So a couple of things there I want to pick up on. One is this idea, and you're absolutely right, that, you know, it, until there's a kind of huge consumer demand and support for this journey, we're not going to get anywhere. Um, and really, I want to go to you, Anna. I'm curious. I mean, it's wonderful that Grosvenor have taken all these moves to change the way you operate. I'm very curious to know, in, in all honesty, how much that's market led and you really had to do that to respond to pressure, or how much that was from within. So for us, I mean, we've been doing this for more than 15 years, and that's really come from within. Uh, as you might imagine, as property owners and developers, we're a little bit, we're a bit of a competitive bunch. And actually, what's been really good over the last few years from a kind of climate perspective is um, we're all getting a little bit competitive uh, over each other, wanting to do it better and faster. But in terms of our, in terms of our approach, actually, for us, it's all about um, our license to operate, you know, why should, you know, why should we exist? Why should people do business with us? And actually we felt that this is, this is one of the most important reasons why people should work with us. We're all extremely committed about it, but it would be, it would be fair to say that in the last couple of years as an industry, the, uh, the competition is, is hotting up. And that can only be a good thing, frankly, about wanting to do it better and faster. But what's also really nice is that there's all this real collaboration as well. So we're not trying to do one over on each other. So I suppose I could put a, a related question to you, John, which is all this work that Interface is doing. Um, to what extent is that essential to protect your place in the market? And on a related point, how do you strike the balance between 
the genuine desire to make progress and actually having to protect your IP and your USP to a certain extent. I mean, Ray Anderson, our founder, used to say, what is the business case for ending life on Earth? We can make the most sustainable, wonderfully, beautifully designed flooring products, but if there's no planet to put them on or no buildings to put them in because we've ruined it, then, you know, it's, it's that's, I mean, it's a guiding principle. We need, we need a place to put our products. Um, for us, I think it's, it's always been our USP. So Ray was a, a visionary leader and back in the nineties and two thousands, that's what sold our products, but I'm seeing a change. One of the things I was very kind of pleased to see at COP was, you know, as Sarah's saying, in terms of the rise of ACAN, um, the rise of agency amongst younger architects, um, we're getting really interesting questions, more demand questions from our customers. And in fact, I see our role as an interface, not as telling people what's the best thing to do and we're great, but empowering our customers and our suppliers to be agents of change. We want to be able to put them in a position where they can make the right decisions, whether it's for our products or for other products, where it makes a difference. And when it comes to IP and our investment into the future, yeah, we'll keep pushing the needle, but the more I can, and there's a group we can get designers, specifiers, landlords to be more demanding of all manufacturers, all service providers, that is what will push the needle forward. The question is, are we going to do it fast enough um, for a transformation trajectory, <laughs> as Roman Kravitz was saying, are we following that reform that isn't going to get us there fast enough? Well, I think that, um, that that picks up on questions that we're getting from the audience, which ask, A, whether we're moving fast enough, but also whether we're actually being ambitious enough. So uh, somebody's saying net zero by 2050 is just another way to kick the can down the road. What we actually need is actual zero by 2030 and net positive well before 2050. How? So, um, Sarah, I'm going to kind of put this to you. Are we setting ourselves sufficiently ambitious targets? Um, no, um, I don't think, I don't, I think that there are targets out there that are certainly being set that are ambitious. It's much more about how you put those into practice. So I suppose that's the point is that targets are, are, are great and they're there to, to hold us all to account in a way, but unless they're being rolled out at pace, then again, I, I can see, like, I agree with the frustration of, you know, kicking the can down the road. Um, we found ourselves, we quite often find ourselves in the room talking about the same things with the same people. Um, and that isn't helping with the acceleration of things. Our, we're more and more increasingly within ACAN, we're finding that what we are trying to do is break out beyond the silos of architecture for those discussions to happen. And as um, as Michael mentioned as well, getting a sea change of public opinion is probably one of the most crucial things um, so that you have got um, pressure from all sides. You know, I think we I found myself saying this a lot recently, but climate change won't be done to people. Sorry, I should say climate action because climate change is being done to people. Climate action won't be done to people. It will happen with people. And so you need to make sure that you're really um, engaging and empowering people. And I think people um, have not maybe realized that they have more power than they have been told they have. And I think it's our job and our duty to sort of bring everybody into those discussions. So it's more than just the standards. It's more than just the, the, the targets that we're hitting. It's also engaging everybody in this discussion and making them realize that they've got a seat at the table. Well, somebody's written here, Brenda Vale doesn't agree that buildings cause a problem, but the food occupants consume. The affluent West's unsustainable lifestyle is a problem. Now, that's quite a big subject for <laughs> this panel to tackle. Um, but in a way, we can't avoid it, can we? So I'll ask you this soon, and I'm sorry, because I know this is a bit of a killer of a question, but I'm sure you're up to it. Um, how, how do we make the link between the subjects that are kind of our comfort zone, the construction industry, if you like, and these, these huge issues about lifestyle that, absolutely part and parcel of any really meaningful attempt to bring about change. I think that we would do very well to focus on the construction industry and see the obstacles within the construction industry that are preventing some of these things happening. I mean, you know, remember, there are people in food, in fashion, in lifestyles and culture. We are all getting on to this subject 
we are not alone here, you know, and we, we, there are a lot of people to collaborate with out there. Uh, people are understanding that, that uh, buildings and homes are very important. And one of the big reasons why everybody needs to be involved in this is that almost everyone lives in a home and without dramatically changing our homes physically, we can't get to a, a, a sustainable, let alone regenerative future. So I think that many, it's, it's, it's right that we are skeptical of the leaders. Uh, I, I'm skeptical to the point of saying we've just got to act independently almost of national governments, but collaborate, especially with city governments, local authorities uh, at the more tractable scale within the construction industry, join things up more within the construction industry. Because just give one example, there are a lot of great targets being set. There's a lot of great leadership being shown by people like Grosvenor, for example, as, as on this panel. Uh, and there are many, many businesses who have understood that they cannot survive in, a, in, the, in the direction that the world is going in. And actually, this has nothing to do with you know, being an activist or uh, being an evangelist. They realize it's a matter of survival. And that's why so many uh, businesses are coming on side. And that's the momentum. I think that's the optimistic, you know, possibilistic as well, Michael, uh, momentum that that we can build on. But let's look at some of the barriers within this industry that despite the leadership and the targets, there's a big mass of people in industry whose day jobs are difficult enough and hard enough as it is without, you know, adhering to those targets to actually act on those targets. I mean, I see this on an everyday level, people on the building sites finding it really hard to translate all those nice ambitions into real action on the ground. And we have to find that way. And, and I think that, you know, I'm, it's fantastic what Sarah said about breaking out the silo of architecture and getting involved in the rest of the industry. I think if we did that, and this is an action plan for change, this panel, this is the, the title. Uh, and if as far as action plans are concerned, we've got so much to be acting on, so many very tangible and tractable things to be doing within the industry. And uh, many of those are already out there on the table. And ACAN has uh, shown a fantastic way, Letty, other people, UKGBC. There are things to do right now. Everybody on this call can, be, uh, can actually very tractably be effective uh, while still uh, complaining about and, and being activists about the larger scale of governments and indeed global leadership, which is a whole other, the world that we saw in, in, in Glasgow uh, falling short yet again. Remember, it was COP26, that tells you everything, 26 years of, of, of annual meetings of 192 governments. Uh, I mean, one thing we can also target, of course, is COP27 in Sharm El Sheikh. So I think there's a lot, of to, lot to be acting on uh, without getting too concerned about, you know, what are the ambitions and how big are the targets? Are we ambitious enough? Michael, there's a real vote of confidence for you here. It says the possibilist, I can't even say it, possibilist part of Michael's thought was so interesting. How do we encourage more practices to become possible? Why can't I say this word? Possibilist. <laughs> possibilist. <laughs> possibilist. Thank you. You got it. Um, Oh, gosh. Well, I mean, <laughs> the, the easiest thing to do here would be to, to make a really shameless plug for my book. But um, no, I mean, I, I think really um, it, it is important to, to sort of transform our, our views of um, agency and, and see how we can, uh, you know, come come together to, to shift some of the things that have conventionally been very difficult to shift at the scale of an individual project or, or even an individual company. And, you know, that's why I think groups like ACAN and Architects Declare, which I was involved in, in setting up, I think that's is why those groups are so important, because by coming together in, the, in those kind of uh, coalitions and the UK GPC, uh, you know, is it is possible it should be easier to bring about the kind of changes that that we need at a systemic level that are actually very difficult to to achieve um at the level of an individual project or company um and 
partly also picking up on the, the Brenda Vale comment, I think that, you know, really underlines the importance of um, transformative models, you know, like the, the 15 minute city. At the moment, there's a real risk that we're going to just go through a sort of shallow transition, because that's the politically easiest thing to do. The politicians are saying, well, you know, it's time to shift from um, internal combustion engine cars to electric cars. That may be okay in a rural area, but in my view, it, it, that would be a disaster in urban areas because it would do nothing to change the dominance of, of cars in urban space. It would do nothing to address uh, obesity, social isolation, social interaction, and so on. And you know, the, the much more transformative model would be something like the 15 minute city, which really would start to, to improve our quality of life, improve our, our, our well-being, um, and would go much further in taking us towards a, a, a one planet lifestyle. We've had a question come in just now, actually, which says we can only go as fast as the planning will allow. And um, this one's actually looking at how quickly it allows buildings to be built or extended. Why has nobody spoken about this in the bottlenecks? I mean, I would also add on to that, um, you know, how do we get our planning system to be much more enabling in terms of these really radical developments to the way cities are planned? John, I don't know if it's unfair to ask you, but um, do you have views on that? Is the planning system actually fit for purpose at the moment, or is it really lagging behind the ambitions of the industry? I'm going to take a very focused view on it because I'm going to talk about embodied carbon, because I think the most interesting stories I've seen in the last couple of weeks were in relation to the tulip for Norman Foster, or more recently, kind of M&S's building on Oxford Street or the assembly rooms in Derby, where embodied carbon has been one of the key considerations. And that's given me a little bit of hope and optimism, because if that is coming into the planning debate, if that's being considered at a council level and at governmental level, that is that is a step forward, but it has to become more mainstream. And then, then you get thinking, you know, how is that? And this is where it might be for the wider, wider group, you know, how's that affect housing? How's that going to affect how, other projects? Is it going to become a mainstream consideration or are these at the moment? Exceptions, how do they become the norm? So uh, th th there was uh, a, a commission called the Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission a couple of years ago, trying to reform planning and transform it. Uh, and whatever you, you may think about some of the politics around that, one of the things that we almost managed to do at one point, which then slipped away again, was actually change the, the wording in the national planning policy framework from, from favoring sustainable development to insisting on regenerative development. Now, so, and this is something that, that I, I at one point thought it was, this was going to be so fantastic that the NPPF was going to require regenerative development, regenerative socially, regenerative environmentally, regenerative economically, leave a place better than you found it always. And that's a requirement, not just the same, not less, not, not do no harm, but build on the idea of biodiversity net gain, which is already in there, to actually just be really ambitious. And I think we could campaign, uh, you know, talking about action again, uh, the planning system could well be uh, a vehicle for this. I certainly wouldn't go about yet again, completely transforming the planning system. Everybody tries that every three or four years, every government tries it and fails. Uh, I think that the real kind of local changes, and I think John's done, absolutely right about the embodied carbon piece. That's the other thing that we can absolutely, um, you know, gather, muster around. But regenerative would be a great thing to replace uh, sustainability with. Anna. Uh, yeah, I would just add that the other thing that we all need um, from the planning system is the people who work in it to kind of have gone on this upskilling kind of education that we've all been through. Um, we've got a really brilliant live example at the moment where we've got a kind of cut and carve add, you know, with the extensions and all the rest of it, uh, development. Um, and actually by doing even more work on, you know, on the carbon side, we've worked out that if you can make the building 
450 mil taller, you can save a huge amount of carbon because actually you're able to use kind of standard steel rather than bespoke steel. And so we now are going to go into the planners and ask them if we can make the building a bit taller because it saves all this carbon. So we're going to have a very interesting debate um, to see how that goes and whether they're happy, you know, happy to make that adjustment for the carbon benefit. But upskilling is going to be key. The other issue, of course, is about hitting the right balance between building transformatively and working with what we've got. Um, and we have a few questions relating to retrofit and Enerfit. Um, so somebody here is saying, how will we retrofit the 80% of all buildings that will be around in 2050 that are already with us now without mm. that tax incentives and government grants? Um, so, Sarah, I know ACAN has been very active on this issue of VAT. What's what's your response to that? I think we've recognised that the issue of VAT is important. I'm not sure we've had huge success on campaigning around it because there's been a lot of people who have been calling for VAT reform for a long time, a long time. I think everybody can recognise how perverse it is to have huge VAT on refurbishment and retrofit projects where new build has nothing. Um, so we recognize that's a problem. I think the question actually about how we're gonna retrofit all these buildings is um, about a shift change in the value systems that um, that we have in the industry generally. Um, I think there's been too long a discussion around um, payback when it comes to um, energy efficiency improvements in, in buildings and we talk a lot about retrofit and it's all very dry. And I think if you're talking, and I, I'm really very much focused on retrofitting domestic buildings, because we've got, you know, everybody will be so familiar with these numbers, but 29 million homes that need um, uh, some kind of um, improvement because 20% uh, of our emissions come from homes. And I think that when you start to change what we get out of it, it's about comfort. Take the climate question away. Um, just park that for a minute. You're making homes more comfortable, more climate resilient, more future proof from risk of fuel poverty, um, a safer place somewhere that doesn't exacerbate issues like skin conditions or um, respiratory conditions, and then drop back in the climate question. And you're also saving on carbon emissions. Um, the fact that the government hasn't recognize this as a long-term strategy that also can deliver jobs at scale and to start looking at retrofit as ways of regenerating communities at large not just sticking a bit of external wall insulation on somewhere but it's a much more comprehensive um, way of addressing much deeper issues within our communities and I think anybody who's interested in a national retrofit strategy will know this and will be really exasperated about why we need to mention the Construction Leadership Council and the work that say retrofit works or parity projects have been doing people powered retrofit in Manchester and um, you know the great homes upgrade call from NEF our own households declare campaign radical housing now I mean the list goes on everybody wants to do this and it's just a massive blind spot it's really you can tell i'm getting a little bit annoyed about it but it is really frustrating so for people who've been trying to ask for vat reform as well just must be tearing their hair out because it's just such a it's just such a win on so many fronts i don't understand the the lack of engagement with it you know and just to finish on a point there's been huge investment in understanding efficiencies in energy supply and in, 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 in how we decarbonize the grid. Where is all that equal research into energy efficiency and efficiency, energy efficiency on how we deliver our energy, but also how we use it, the reduction in demand, you know, that that's just absolutely not nearly engaged with enough and, and could deliver so much in positive terms. Okay, I'm going to just jump back now to the issue of building a new. I've got this fantastically direct question, which I'm going to put to all of you. Uh, it says, so from the panel, what is the one thing you would suggest to cut carbon on a new build? Um, John, I'm going to kick off with you. One thing. At the outset, look to be measuring the carbon impact for your, your, your build or your retrofit. Go and use one of the many platforms that are now available. Um, and demand of your manufacturers, EPDs, and scores on embodied carbon. 
Uh, Sunand, you, what's the one thing you'd suggest to cut carbon on a new build? Do it. <laughs> I'd say that, that, that you, you know, if you decide to do it, is the one thing I'd say. There isn't, you know, every building is different. Uh, every situation is different. It'll all, they'll all have their own modalities. But uh, as John says, measure it, do it, declare it, become aware. I, that the lack of awareness of this uh, is is still spectacular. Uh, it's it's you know if just just take architects, thirty five thousand architects in the, in the country. I, I, you know, really by now every one of them should have known exactly how to tackle carbon. They don't. Uh, even though that was all, you know, kicked off in the early 2000s, uh, even earlier than that. So do it. OK, thank you. And Michael, what's your response? Yeah, so um, I, I would advocate always taking a systemic approach to carbon rather than a narrow focus. And um, I'm going to use an example from slightly, slightly outside the construction industry to, to make this point. So. Um, we know uh, from scientific data that about 50% of the, the nitrogen in, in US forests came from the ocean and it came up the, the rivers through massive flows of salmon that were eaten by bears and eagles and then pooped out in the forest and taken up by the trees. Now, if someone were to come along and say, okay, from a carbon perspective, it'd be a great idea to put a hydroelectric dam on this river because we can get lots of clean energy. What has happened is that that has cut the flow of nitrogen up the rivers to the forests and made the forests much more susceptible to forest fire. And when those forests burn, it's a carbon nightmare. And, and that's the kind of thing that can happen if you take a narrow focus on, on carbon. And another thing that can happen is, is that if you, if you were to just go every time for the lowest carbon solution, it could easily displace the problem to, to produce other challenges. You know, for instance, um, it could it could result in a lower carbon material that is much higher in terms of toxicity, and I do worry that the the focus on carbon, of course, is absolutely crucial. You know, climate change is the absolutely crucial thing that we've got to address, but there are other issues that I feel are kind of crowded out, and one issue that is is barely discussed at all, um, and this might sound like a bizarre example, but um, you know the the average. Uh, male sperm count in Europe is going to reach the, the threshold of infertility long before we get to net zero. And that is largely to do with the way we make things and the toxins that are building up in the environment. And I, I find it staggering. You know, European humans are due to be sterile by the mid Ninety uh, by the mid by the mid twenty thirties, and yet no one is talking about it. I've written to health ministers and environment ministers about this for the last fifteen years, and never get a response. So anyway, I'm, what I'm advocating is a systemic approach rather than a narrow focus. Okay, thank you for that, um, Anna. Over to you. So, what's the one thing you would suggest to cut carbon? So I I was going bill? to say set yourself a target as well. So yeah, I was going to say set yourself a target, but on the basis that we've already had that one, I would say really look at material reuse, because although it's a new build, there's opportunity to use materials that have already been used once before. Uh, and I think this is a, such an exciting bit and such an, from a design perspective, actually so interesting. Um, uh, so I would, yeah, I would advocate material reuse um, and see how we can okay. squeeze it in, in in everything that we do. Thank you. And Sarah, finally, what's your one thing? I could be quite flippant now and just say, um, don't build it. Um, but in practical terms, um, ask if it if you need it. Like, so, you know, um, Sinan said, um, do it. And I like to build on that and say, ask if you need to do it in, in the first instance. I think kind of bridging what Sinan said and, and what Michael has touched on um, a lot, which is just you know, really stepping back to see if um, if there are other opportunities and if we're really, really engaging with those. So looking at the reuse of existing buildings, which um, sounds like a, a repeated point that doesn't have as much weight as it needs to have, but it's those sorts of things. It's really asking, like looking at what you've you've got and where you can interact with that and just really interrogating whether or not you need 
to do things, but having that built into your approach before you even, you know, that old adage, before you even lift up a pen, like have the conversation about what you're doing and why it needs to be done. And I think, I mean, a few people have commented on that. So to read a sample, I've got net zero by 2050, but how? Don't build anything. Um, oh, another, a, a big issue that's coming up is this um, issue of the sort of international dialogue, if you like. So for example, somebody has just said, oh good, but we in the UK are just a speck in the world. What about the rest of the world? Other people are saying, surely now time is, it's time to listen to less developed societies. Um, soon I'm gonna to go to you because obviously the UK GBC, the clue is in the name, has, has to focus, you have to focus somewhere. Um, how how much do you think that international dialogue is actually working and necessary? It's absolutely uh, ne necessary. It's ob absolutely not working. Um, otherwise, we would not be where we are, uh, going back to the 26 uh, point. But um, that the idea that really our actions are pointless because other polluters uh, have far more impact in, in weeks and months than we do in a whole year, that doesn't wash. The Industrial Revolution benefited the West. Uh, its GDP was tied to the carbon that we've put in the atmosphere. Uh, just we, we've got, we have got to absolutely act on it uh, and international cooperation is happening in a good way as outside governments, uh, exchange of information and so on. And it is to some extent happening within governments for the UK GBC, which is of course part of the world GBC as well. Uh, it's coordinating with uh, other GBCs worldwide, but very much to find out how and what to do rather than uh, and of course to campaign at the policy level but obviously we don't we cannot make policy i think that one thing we can focus on now is cop 27 uh sharm el sheikh in in 11 months time i think that if if glasgow was the last chance saloon as so many said uh this i mean i don't know what happens after the last chance saloon there must be a, a word for for that but that is sharm el sheikh and i think we need to mobilize and I think one of the most impactful things, by the way, in terms of international cooperation is when the vulnerable countries are in the room and, and actually speaking from the heart, not climate change as some future possibility that still there is a mindset that it's kind of not here yet and we've got to protect future generations. Current livelihoods are being destroyed, current societies are being destroyed and the people to whom it's happening were there in Glasgow, but not nearly in the same numbers as in Paris because of British immigration uh, rules and uh, to some extent COVID and, and other failures, I think, of really being inclusive in Glasgow. It was a very exclusive event, but the most electric moments in that exclusive event were when those people from vulnerable countries were in the room and, and saying things like, I don't believe you because the biggest lobby here is not a nation, but the fossil fuel industry. When someone stands up and there's no one who can answer that, you know, and to some, to give their credit to the British uh, leadership, Nigel Topping and Alok Sharma, uh, it, whatever I might think of his government, actually there's no question they were sincere about and, and affected by this. And we just, I, I'm really hoping then Sharm El Sheikh that that international cooperation isn't just about people working out what to do, but the people who are really being hurt by it be in the room and because there's no shortage of solutions. This is not, the issue is not solutions. The issue is the will to act and to get on and, and, and take the actions that we need to take. And that's a fantastic note to end it on. So thank you, Sunan, for that. I'd like to thank again, all our presenters who've all given us fantastic talks. So Anna Bond, Sunan Prasad, Sarah Edmonds, John Koo, Michael Paulin, and of course, Julie Hiragoyen, who gave our keynote presentation at the start of the session. And huge thanks to our content partners, Interface. And of course, thank you all for joining us today.